and welcome to the 6-5 Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners of Futurum Research. My team at Futurum and the team at More Insight and Strategy are so happy to have you with us today. In this fireside chat conversation, Moore's Patrick Moorhead is joined by Dennis Hoffman, the Senior VP of Corporate Strategy for Dell. And their conversation discusses how changes in our world, including our increased reliance on data, are driving capital IT investments. I don't know about you, but this is one conversation I can't wait to hear more of. Come on, let's check it out. Hi, Dennis. Uh, welcome to the 6.5 Summit Cloud Track. Uh, I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Pat. It's, it's great to be here. Thanks again. Uh, Dennis, uh, let's start off with the easy questions first. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you do for Dell Technologies? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I lead corporate strategy for Dell Tech. Um, I work with Michael and Jeff Clark, basically to make sure we've got a winning strategy and and we're, uh, we're actually executing it. So it's a little bit of a mix of trying to see around corners make sure we don't get ourselves painted into corners um and uh and otherwise just helping lead the company as we uh, as we drive forward yeah you know the past decade it's easier for me the industry analyst the pundit uh, to look at strategies but it's helped me really to get an appreciation for dell technology strategies because you know i used to have a real job uh, for 20 years uh so Dennis, it's been a crazy time uh, with COVID-19, and, and I'm curious, has that changed how businesses that you talk to are looking at their IT journeys and investments in the future? And is it different from a post-COVID world where we're stuck today? Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. You know, we do a bunch of research. We've been uh, studying at a universe of roughly 4,000 companies for the last uh, since 2016 or so, and we've been tracking their journey uh, along this digital maturity curve, asking them where where do you see yourself on this journey, what place are you in, and so we we built a pretty decent database of the the stages of digital maturity, which you could loosely describe as laggard, uh, leader, and in the middle somewhere learner. Yeah, and the answer to your question depends entirely on where somebody is on that journey. I guess they would all probably say, yeah, the, the pandemic has certainly impacted their view of IT, but the impact is, is significantly different. Uh, for a, a laggard, the, uh, the, the pandemic impact has been to dramatically reduce IT spending. For a leader, it has been actually a net increase of what they were spending and what they thought they would spend before the pandemic even hit. And then along the way, all sorts of different viewpoints on everything from public cloud utilization to uh, multi-cloud world and those sorts of things. So very big impact, but net net nothing but a, a let's say an accelerator of the need to mature digitally. I appreciate that uh, segmentation, Dennis, and I'm I'm seeing the same thing uh, front and center with with uh, large enterprises and small enterprises. Uh, have you seen any difference uh, in, in a post-COVID? So for instance, are businesses are even planning a, a year out? Yeah, again, leaders are. Yeah. The, the segment of digital transformation leaders, uh, I think, you know, they've essentially they figured out that IT or technology and, and the way they employ it is the answer. And so um, there are a number of subsequent business transitions or transformations that, that they're realizing. Everything from uh, my business continuity planning has to be dramatically different. The amount of work from home I will sustain uh, as a base level is going to be different. Remaking supply chains, huge use of automation. You know, literally anything, everybody's learning now. And what's really ratcheting up very quickly on uh, in our research that wasn't there at first is a growing recognition of the increased security challenge associated with all of this remote. Yeah, it's fascinating uh, on, on supply chain, big time manufacturers, it, it it's black and white. They need to come up with a new plan. As I, I always say in my notes, the calculus has changed uh, on supply chain, particularly uh, when it involves Asia. Uh, so. Dell was one of the first companies to talk about hybrid cloud, and, and that was at a time when, of course, the public cloud players weren't even talking about its existence, I think, for obvious reasons. But 
Uh, now, I think it's safe to say with all the public cloud players and all the traditional on-prem companies, it is a hybrid cloud world. But uh, even though we have a lot of people participating, uh, is this really the way that enterprises want to see hybrid cloud? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, look, at the end of the day, it is about workloads and the devil's in the details. You know, workloads have certain attributes, the, the level at which they must perform, where their economics are superior, uh, what, what do you trust, where do you trust? And increasingly, as the edge emerges, data gravity, where's the data created? Where does it need to live? And as it turns out, there's a spread of attributes on, on those basic dimensions that say certain workloads belong in the public cloud. Certain workloads are actually far better in a private cloud. Some workloads don't belong in any cloud at all. And as organizations try to knit all of that together, it's made, I think, the, this notion of hybrid cloud um, more prominent in, in people's conversations, as you, as you pointed out early on, you know, for the public cloud folks, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. But now I think because this is really fundamentally about workloads, workloads haven't changed, but their attributes differ. It is absolutely something that we're, certainly we're seeing all of our customers get to ultimately. But back to my earlier comment, digital laggards are still learning about that. Digital leaders are, you know, hands down, it's a multi-cloud world, end of story. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the, the realities of uh, data sovereignty, uh, latency, and control are some of the biggest reasons that still 80% uh, of those applications are, are still on-prem. And now by having cloud models uh, on-prem, it, it is almost, and then you add consumption models to it, it it's almost, uh, it's to a really good point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, cloud is a way of operating IT, not a place. Everybody wants to operate in a more elastic, self-service, automated way. Uh, and it's just a question of, of where one does that. But to your point, with so many of the public cloud models now coming on-prem, whether it's Azure Stack or Outpost, yeah. I think everybody's kind of acknowledged that, that hybrid or multi-cloud is really the reality. Yeah, I definitely wanted to hit, hit you with that. And uh, I know it's slightly different, but there is a difference between multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Um, I, I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure that that I get the answer from you. Uh, multi-cloud exists today. Um, it's not necessarily optimized to, to float from cloud to cloud very easily. Uh, security and network seem, networking seem to be a tough thing. Uh, how is Dell Technology viewing multi-cloud? Yeah, well, we're, we're viewing it first and foremost as an opportunity, but I think that's also why you hear very specific phrasing in the industry. Uh, people build a hybrid cloud, but we always refer to it sort of as a multi-cloud world, yeah. which I think is a, a tip of the cap to the fact that nobody's really saying a, any given workload is going to burst from on your premises to someone's public cloud, to another person's public cloud, and then back to your premises, which was some of the initial notion, if you remember, around clouds, was that there'd be all this workload bursting. Almost uh, almost arbitraging, too, if you're maybe trying to save a buck here, here or there. Exactly. And the reality is it's far too complex and risky and, and yeah. not the point. The fact that it's a multi-cloud world simply recognizes that the best place for my workload may be at any given time for different set of workloads a SaaS app, a public cloud IaaS, my own data center, yeah. either in a, in a cloud or not. And it's that ability to say workloads encapsulated and denominated the same way, give me the flexibility to place a workload where I wish, not necessarily the because of the fact that I intend to pull that workload, arbitrage it all over the place. Yeah. So. Uh, given the desire, you know, every, you you can't look at any market study that says enterprises aren't interested in multi-cloud, and and I think if you take it at its at its strictest definition, everybody is doing multi-cloud if you have a SaaS. But to your point, this notion of being able to leverage all of your data, regardless of where it is. It is, I think, the spirit of multi-cloud and the ability to, if you wanted to lift and shift, let's say, a container-based uh, type of application from one environment to the other, you could do it, but it's going to take a, a little bit of work. Uh, are, 
what are you recommending to enterprises to get them ready for this multi-cloud uh, opportunity? Uh, uh, you know, maybe it comes in three or, or, or five years from now. Yeah, I mean, we tend to recommend two things. I guess at the end of the day, we would we would say to to our customers and our partners, IT really only needs to be able to do two things at the highest level. They must understand where a workload ought to live or run and where the data associated with it should live, both in its original form and in derivative form, so raw data analysis of the data. So where should a workload live and where should the data reside? And then have the ability to do it, right? So it's on that ability to do it part that we end up doing a lot of our work. There's two things that are critical. First, a well-run private cloud. If you're not actually using cloud principles to run your own data center in a competitive way, it will never meet the criteria I outlined earlier, whether it's performance, economics, trust, data gravity. You'd say, no, I'm not the best place for that. So running a private cloud well, and that's something we obviously work a lot with our customers on, trying to help them uh, make certain that they have operational excellence, the right technology, people, process in order to run a cloud. The other thing which is absolutely vital is you need some sort of fabric to connect it all. You need a consistent way to manage the workload, whether you're running it on your prem, running it on somebody else's prem. Um, and, and that's where you know some form of a universal software platform that connects and manages, controls, secures um, workload is key. And that's for us, obviously, um, one of the main thrusts of the VMware organization as part of Dell Tech. Yeah, so uh, Dennis, do you have any uh, uh, final words uh, of, of inspiration as people dart between this uh, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud world, uh, given uh, the pandemic? Uh, you know, if, if let's say they are a laggard, what's the first thing that they should do and, and how do they get there? Yeah, no, it's a great, I get that question a lot um, from, from people who believe they are laggards, whether in fact they are or aren't by any kind of objective criteria. And I think look, the answer comes down largely to, uh, you be, we need to begin to change the, the reputation and role of information technology within that specific organization. You know, there's a couple of leading indicators. Where does the CIO report? You know, in, in digital laggards, three quarters of them don't report to CEOs right. in leaders half or more, you know, it's, it's, just, you can even, it's just the importance placed on the function. So when you're, you know, if you believe I'm not really where I want to be, first thing we got to do is we have to pick out a, a program of great business importance to the organization enabled by technology and put every resource we've got on it to prove that we can do something other than what, our reputation says we can do, and from there then begin to build. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, a lot of times people are recommending these small wins, but it sounds like you're recommending uh, a big bat and making a big difference. And I think to really represent to the organization that this is important and big things can be, be done, not just small things. Absolutely, because without that, I mean, you're literally fighting a, a almost a reputation change promotional war within your own organization, who probably knows more about one of the hyperscale cloud providers and their offerings than they do about their own IT organization. If you just do a little win, it's a yawn. Go do something that really matters and, and nail it, and then promote that within the organization that, you know, we have the capability to enable the digital transformation of this company. And everything starts to change. The amount of money that flows into information technology, the way they're viewed as business partners, it's by no means easy, but there there is a path, and we help a lot of companies on that journey. I love that. Uh, go big or stay home. <laughs> Very sage uh, words, particularly if if you're a laggard, uh, because and I think as we've seen, and and I look at these uh, in ten year increments. If you're not moving and you're a laggard and you don't move, you'll likely you'll likely be out of business, and and. I think it's a little bit in our face, a little bit more when we look at the, you know, the S and P 500, or, or who's in the Dow, or who's in these indexes. Uh, the the change 
of the makeup of these companies, one thing that I notice is the companies that are moving off of those rankings are the one that really haven't embraced change, uh, either organizationally or uh, through their through their technology. Oh, absolutely right. And you can see it in the numbers. Digital leaders are growing revenue at 8%. 80% of them consider IT an innovation partner. And as a result, they're growing IT spending by 4%. Laggards aren't growing. 60% of them think of IT as a cost center and they're spending no extra money on technology. And as a result, they're only getting further behind their peers who are actually embracing it. Yeah, and I, I actually believe as, as we get a, a lot deeper into machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, I, I could make the case that every company is going to become an intellectual property company and uh, a technology company. I mean, let's even look at, at, at shipping as an example. Uh, once we get to self-driving trucks, uh, what differentiates these trucks from the other? It's likely going to be better algorithms, more efficient and safe algorithms uh, to get you there. And, and I can make this application to a lot of a lot more brownfield uh, businesses uh, than that. Absolutely. There's a theory that the only true competitive advantage we're ultimately going to have is the information we gain from the way we conduct business because our people are actually transient. And, uh, and that's why I think for many of the leaders, this is a race to kind of close the circle between expanding IT architectures, which we dis just discussed, advances in digital uh, and data analytics, and ultimately the ability to get the insights from those data analytics back into the business through modern software development. It's just a cycle and it is a race. And for those that aren't yet on it, um, they're, they're going to really face a hurdle going forward. And those that are on it are realizing that, as you say, they're intellectual property companies. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, Dennis, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. And unfortunately, re we've reached the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing your insights uh, with the 6-5 Summit uh, and the audience. Uh, and this is Patrick Moorhead from More Insights and Strategy signing off with Dell Technologies' Dennis Hoffman for the 6-5 Summit.